Read with me Matthew chapter number 6, verses number 9 through verse number 13. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This prayer, this prayer is prayed by billions of people every day in languages all over the world. In fact, it's safe to say that at every moment, someone is uttering this prayer. Isn't that good news? To know that at every moment, someone is uttering this prayer. It's the first prayer that we really learn to pray when we are growing up as children, and it's oftentimes the last prayer that we hear before we die. Our Father, who art in heaven, there's so many ways you can say it, but if you just take your time, those 63 words, and only 63 words, depending on which version you, you're reciting, less than one minute, but it can do just eternal good to your soul when you simply just allow the prayer to be uttered from your spirit. I want to share this same prayer from the Message Bible. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best as above, so below. Keep us alive with thee. Keep us given with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Now, what's so different about that prayer than the Lord's Prayer? Is it any less reverent? The words are different. But if you read this same verse in Spanish, same scripture, the words would be totally different and you wouldn't understand them. But it does not mean that they do not make sense because you don't understand them. See, the understanding comes from your level of perception about something. If you know how to speak a language, then it's very clear to you. It's very understood. To this, some people understand the Message Bible version better than the King James Version because it's clear to them. Scripture speaks to your spirit. That's what we have to know. When you read the Bible, oftentimes we read with our own understanding. We try to understand things. But when you allow yourself to get beyond understanding and let your spirit decipher the word of God, it speaks to you on a different revelation. You can read a passage of scripture one day and read it the next day and have a different revelation. Because one day you may read it with your understanding, the other day you may be reading it with your spirit. When you pray, if you're going through something, you pray differently. Because you can pray with your understanding, but if, if you're really struggling with something, if you're really are dealing with something, you pray from your spirit. It's no longer just our Father who art in heaven, it's our Father who art in heaven. And you are really going a different direction when you're allowing your spirit to pray. And when we pray, the Bible says our spirit prays. You don't pray from your understanding. It's not that you can be so eloquent and give God wonderful words to hear and God's impressed. Oh, look at you. That was a good prayer. Oh, man, that was good. i got to give you what you're asking for. No, it's, it's your spirit. When your spirit pray, you, just, you can just say, Lord, be merciful to me. Oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the words of your mouth... And the meditations of your heart are acceptable to God because he understands. He looks beyond all of the stuff that condemns us and he goes to our hearts. Adore and acknowledge God. Adore and acknowledge God. And Proverbs says, in all your ways acknowledge him, meaning God, and he shall direct your paths. Now I want to start back with our prayer. Lord's Prayer. What we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm just going to share that. First, this prayer gives to those who pray 
and identity, our Father. And we have one Father. That means you can't have cousins and uncles and nephews and step cousins and grands. Our means you have brothers and sisters. When you have a father, a common father, that means you all are brothers and sisters. So when you are connected with Christ, when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you now have a father. And now you have brothers and sisters in Christ. So you have a new identity. Old things are truly passed away and everything in your life becomes new as a result of this identity that you have. Our also indicates two things, either community prayer or intercessory prayer. It's not my father. You're not praying a personal prayer. Our father, that means you're praying with or for somebody else. Whenever you're praying our, give us this day. Deliver us from evil. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. You see, you're not praying for yourself. You're praying in community. Our father, more than you. The next verse, verse number 10, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven. We're praying that God's kingdom that is on heaven would come here on earth. In heaven, there's no democracy. We have a democracy here. That means the majority rule. We vote, and whatever we vote on, that's the way that we go. But that's not how it is in kingdom. It's what God says. It's, not a, the it's a theocracy, not a monocracy, monocracy or a democracy. It's what God says. God rules. So we want God's kingdom to rule here on earth. Lord, let your kingdom rule here. And how does that happen? Through believers. I don't do it the way, the democratic way. What is God's way? Verse number 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Can we pray? Can we pray to be rich? Okay. Okay. When we pray, what, what, is, what is it that God promises us? Today. We're promised today, right? So if God made you rich and you died today, what good is tomorrow? There was one in scripture, one person who was rich, and he decided to go and build bigger barns to hold all of his goods. And that same day he died. And all of his goods was distributed to someone else. So what he's saying in this scripture, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, allow me to be everything that I can be today. Let me be the greatest blessing to the greatest number of people today. We store up so many things for the future. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So that means we should be asking God for the sufficiency of today. Not to say that we don't pray and believe God for his best. We can believe that we don't pray some prayer that we're going to live in the future. We want to do all that we can today. Today is a gift from God. Your greatest good is going to happen to you today. Your best is today. Make it the best day possible. Living for next week, next year, next month, when you retire, it's not promised. Give us this day our daily bread. When God brought manna down from heaven, he rained manna down. He says, collect only enough for one day. One day of manna. And they tried to collect it in jars and keep extra, but the next day it was spoiled. He only gave them enough for one day. What is God giving you today? God has blessed us to have more than enough right now. And sometimes, rather than really being grateful for what God has given us, we're praying for more. Some of us want more, but we can't handle more. We think we can handle more. But sometimes we get it, we find out that we couldn't handle it. So sometimes God's giving you just what you can handle. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 and 9, it says, Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed, feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of my God. You're saying in the scripture, don't give me God too much and don't let me have too little. But you know what I'm able to handle. If I had too much God, I might 
boast and disown you. If I had too little, I might steal and dishonor you. So God is giving you, and many times, what you're able to handle right now. If some of you won the lottery, we might not never see you in church again. Hmm? I've had people that didn't even get the lottery. Someone just got a job and left church. <laughs> lost a job at church. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah, I lost my job. Okay. They don't see what happened. Well, like I'm working now. Okay. Did God know that? So when we pray for something, God knows what we can handle, and God knows what we will do with what we're asking for. Are we going to honor him with more? If we can't honor him with less, will we really honor him with more? Because a predictor of future behavior is present behavior. What you're doing now is a determining factor about how you'll handle the future. I've even prayed that God not allow me to get so high-minded and anything that I'm no good to the kingdom. Some pastors can get puffed up with pride because of position or status or whatever, and they will lose that focus. I sometimes don't want our church to get so big that I lose the touch that I have with each one of you. Maybe that's selfish on my part. I sometimes don't like going to churches where you can't get in touch with the pastor, where you never know the pastor. And as soon as he, he's like the, the phantom that comes in, he appears, and then he's gone. In fact, some churches don't even see him. He's on the screen. They would go to church, hundreds of people, maybe thousands, and just watch him on the screen. That's getting too big. So I'm asking that God allow me to be humble so where I don't grow and become high-minded. That should be your prayer also. God, allow me to honor you with everything. And whatever it takes, if you get too proud, accept God's humility. Accept God's humility, because sometimes God will humble us in ways that we don't understand and ways that we don't like. Because humility means that we may have to change some things that we don't want to change. But that's God's way of touching us and letting you know to just slow down. I'm still God. I'm still God. Because we can forget to pray. I don't know if you've been so troubled that you've missed days of praying. If you have time to worry, you have time to pray. Right? And you may find that when you worried most, you prayed less. We need to turn this worrying time into praying time. Right? If we've got time to worry, we've got time to pray. But we can spend hours worrying. That's coming up a little bit later in, in, in uh, chapter 6, another, another sermon. But we can spend a lot of time worrying. And worrying does not change anything. Just worrying in of itself. If you're being constructive and trying to develop a plan, that's not worry. That's, now you're being constructive. But just worrying about stuff that just doesn't really matter. What somebody said and what's going on. Let's be change agents. Let's change things. Give us a day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, forgive us our debts. We say trespasses. And nowhere in Scripture, I, find, I looked at all the translations. All the translations says debts, debts. Debts, debts. So where does this trespasses come from? The Catholic Church. When they reviewed and interpreted the Bible and the Latin, they would find that debt indicated to them that something owed. So you say, give us our debts. Give us what we owe and forgive the people that owes us. And they felt it didn't cover everything. What about the people that sinned against us and people that have done wrong or harm that needed forgiveness? So, so it was translated into trespass. But if you look also in Scripture and, and all the versions, it, it, it also correlates that. In verse number 14, I'm going to read. Now this is after the model prayer, which ends at verse 13. Here's verse number 14. Okay? If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So you see how that can also relate. Forgive us our trespasses as, as, as those who trespass against us. Our sins, give us our debts. So there is a way that you can translate the two, but in Scripture directly, when we pray, 
We use trespasses, and we're probably one of the few people that come here and say, why do you say trespasses? You know, we just started doing it, and we've always done it that way. Is that how we do it? Why do you do that? Because we've always done it that way. Why do you read King James Version? Because that's the way that God wrote it. <laughs> God wrote King James, and that's why I read King James. When you look at New International Version, which I love New International Version for a long time, that was the version that spoke to me. When I came back to Christ, I was reading the New International Version because it was simple language and it was easy to understand. But as I started to grow and mature spiritually, I started going back to the New King James and going back to the King James. And the King James was just as clear to me as the New International Version. But it was my level of understanding at the time. So the King James speaks just as clearly, but again, it's spiritual revelation that you get when you read scripture. It's not always understanding, it's revelation. Revelation, amen? All right, now, forgive us our debts teaches us to live with imperfections and also with the imperfections of others. Ask God, forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. In other words, God, do to me as I've done to others. Forgive me and, and treat me the way I've treated everybody else, in other words. That's a whole different spin, huh? <laughs> treat me, Lord, the way I treat the waiter, the server, the bank teller, the person at the cleaners, the person that cuts me off on the freeway, the person that upsets you, the person that waves the goodbye to you with one, well, anyway. Treat me that way, the way I treat others. And that's what we're asking God. Is that really fair? If so, we should be thinking about how we treat everybody. We should treat everybody and honor them the way that you would expect to be honored. Remember the, gold, the golden rule, right? He who has the gold makes the rule. No, no. <laughs> the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, whether they deserve it or not especially sometimes to those who may not seem to deserve it because they need it most. They need understanding, they need compassion, they need your gentleness, they need your peace, they need your self-control, and that's when we are best able to share Jesus with them. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors as we forgive. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We pray, lead us not into temptation, but Jesus, the Bible says, was led by the wilderness. Well, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. Right? That was the temptation. He was led into temptation because he had to face Satan. We pray, God, lead me away from temptation so I won't face the evil one. We like that Psalm 23. And that's the second most read and most quoted scripture is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That's a wonderful scripture to pray, but that's, how we, that's the God that we want. God, lead me beside still waters. Green pastures, restore my soul. But sometimes you're taken into some situations where you will have to grow and trust God. We don't like them, so we pray, God, lead me away from this. Even Jesus prayed, God, take this cup, or Father, take this cup away from me. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had to face the cross. Father, take this cup away. But then he said, but not my will, but let your will be done. If I have to go through this, God, I'll go through this, and I trust you. We have to just trust him. We don't want to go through some things, but while we're going through them, He's saying, you trust me? Do you really trust me to go through this diagnosis? Do you trust me to go through this poverty period? Do you trust me in the night season of your life? Can you only praise God when things are going well? Do, can you really reach down beyond your bills and your debt and your doubt and pull up a hallelujah anyhow? Is it that difficult to really give God a shout of praise when things around you are just torn apart? Because that's when praise really relevates the loudest. 
when you got to praise through some things. You got to push aside stuff and give God glory. That's when he hears you the most. When you got to set aside every weight, every sin, and give God glory and praise. It's like that rooster that, that, that a storm came and tore down the chicken coop and, and tore down everything. And, and, the, and the chicken coop was a pile of rubbles. And when, as soon as the storm was over, the rooster got up on top of it and he began to crow. Because crowing is what he does. When you've got nothing, if praise is in you, then praise is what's going to come out of you. At your lowest point, you'll still give God praise. Because that is what we do. It's not something that you do on Sunday. In your worst moment, you still got something praiseworthy. It cannot be all dark. It may appear to be dark sometimes. But you've got to know that God always allows light to be somewhere. Keep focusing on the light. The word says God is light. Keep your focus on him and he will navigate you through. In any dark situation, if you see light, it gives you hope. They've had people that have been stuck in tunnels. And one thing that lets them know when they are going to get their way out when they see light somewhere. Because when you're in a dark situation, the one thing that you need to give you a focus and hope is light. If you see light, that means there's a way out. Wherever you are, God's always going to leave light. Don't lose your sight and focus on the light that God gives you. Satan wants you to focus on all the darkness around you, but no, just keep your eye on the light. And God will navigate you through that situation. Let's give God one more round of praise. For yours. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The prayer ends the same way it began, with praise and glory. You begin your prayer with a shout of praise and you end your prayer with a shout of praise. Prayer will change everything about you from the inside out. We want things to change from the outside in. God starts working with us from the inside out. He will, the Bible says that weeping endures through the night. You get that? But joy comes in the morning. That don't make any sense. Listen, think about that. You're crying all night. But then in the morning you have joy. Somewhere in that midnight hour, God has stepped in and began to turn those tears into cheers and that pouting into praise. And the same thing that took you, one thing took you to bed at night, but by the time you got to the morning, there was joy. It didn't say that God changes things around you. He says to give you joy in the morning. So when your joy starts coming, you know God's at work. When you start getting your joy back, things are about to change in your life because you got joy. Nothing has changed around you, but the joy that he gives you lets you know that God is in this. When you feel his presence, it's time to shout about it. Just pray and believe God. And when he starts restoring you, you start feeling joy coming back. That's the beginning of change. Give me that joy. So when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, the prayer was one that we think about, God, we should pray anytime. Along the freeway, we can pray this prayer. We pray before church. We pray it when we end our meetings. And I'm going to ask that we can pray as Jesus taught his disciples as I close. Pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's give God a shout of praise. Good word. Good word. Good word.